Welcome to the second session of this morning. Um, I hope everybody's back from the coffee break. So I have the pleasure to talk about unbending. So before we heard about the contrast transfer function, which we learned as the inverse Fourier transform of the points bet function. And um, so we're trying to correct for um, these effects, which are introduced by the imaging system. And now I'm going to be talk, talk, uh, talking about um, physical distortion. So before we had perturbations of our image by the imaging system. Now we, ha um, we need to correct for distortions in our 2D crystals in our image. And this is what we call unbending. And it's probably one of the most important um, step, image processing step of 2D crystals. So let's start. In an ideal world, our crystal would look like something like this. If you consider one square as a unit cell, right? They're all perfectly aligned, a perfect lattice. Unfortunately, with real crystals, it would look something like this. So you would have your unit cells, and some of them would not be lined perfectly on, on a lattice. So our first task is um, to recognize which unit cells are not perfectly aligned to correct for this, right? And what we need for this is some kind of reference. I'll get, um, um, the question is also how do we get the reference if we don't know anything about the crystal? Well, we get to that in a, in a bit. So if, say, we have a reference of our unit cell, then to find the distortions, you would just slide along all your unit cells, and this way you'll discover the deviation here. So you can use a similarity measure, say, for example, of cross correlation, as we've heard before, and then you'll see here that the peak of your cross correlation map will not be in the center of the reference, but will be more top, and you'll get a deviation. So you get a vector say, saying, okay, this. Um, unit cell is not per perfectly aligned, is, is distorting your crystal. So, what can we do about this? Well, we need to correct for it, for it right? And this is the, what we call unbending. So, you, you would calculate all these distortions and try to then really, in the image, correct for it by shifting these unit cells. This is a simplified version I get to the a bit more advanced version afterwards. We've heard about the reciprocal space. We heard about the um, Fourier theory yesterday. And in reciprocal space, um, your perfect crystal would be um, a list of diffractions. Uh, the Fourier transform of your perfect crystal would be a, um, just a perfect lattice of diffraction spots, sharp diffraction spots, right? That's what we saw in the power spectrum, the amplitudes. Um, with an imperfect crystal, this reflects in the diffraction spots that you don't have sharp peaks, sharp diffraction spots, but you have smeared out spots. So you, so in, um, so, and these smeared out fraction spots are actually, yeah, just different contributions. And you want to, sh basically, what uh, unbending in reciprocal space means you want to sharpen these spots. And now I'll get to a bit, how do you get the reference that you could, um, we heard about Fourier filtering, but what you can do is ju just take the components of your Fourier transform that lie on the lad lie perfectly in the lattice, so you mask your Fourier transform, you tightly mask, say, I only allow these informations that lie perfectly on, on my determined lattice, and thereby filter it, filter out all the, all the rest, and can, can get to a, um, in a first reference. And when you then compare this with your original image, you can 
via cross correlation, for example, you can um, determine this, this distortions and then do an unbending. So this is the same method, just in re reciprocal space. And um, as we've heard yesterday, correlation is just a multiplication in Fourier space with the complex angle at the beginning. So now to see the bigger picture, uh, I'll try to, this is this, the whole scheme of it, um, 2D crystal processing. We heard yesterday about um, lattice determination. You all had the joy of determining your lattice with 2DX yesterday in the practical. Um, so you now know what a lattice is. Um, we also did defocused determination. And with the lecture before, you now know how to correct for it. And we'll see in the afternoon how um, we do that with 2DX. <coughs> and then comes the process of unbending. So, zoom, um, I told you that we create a reference and we have to create a reference. And the only reference that we have, so the only information that we have is our image, right? So creating a reference means, or first of all, um, you want to compare your image with a reference. But um, your image will contain noise. And the first thing you can do before unbending is actually Fourier filtering. Now that you've determined your lattice, you know that at least in the vicinity of your lattice spots, um, all your information should be, and outside is just noise. And noise um, is, shouldn't be periodic, periodically, shouldn't be. So this will just, um, would, wouldn't, inf um, that means in Fourier space, it wouldn't form spots, right? It's just um, dust, kind of, if you can imagine. So what I show here is actually what you get um, in 2DX, that um, we've taken just uh, um, spots that have a high signal-to-noise ratio, or a high IQ value, is what we call it, and we just filtered with a mask. And that's still our image, just, uh, just Fourier filtered. Our reference, you can't probably see it, but it's the same spot, but only filtered much, tight, much more tightly. So we're one pixel radius or two pixel radius, right? And that's what I said. You just allow the, and you just take the information that's already aligned. And then you get a reference, a reference image. And what you do with that full reference image is that you cut an area. This is going to be a, bless you. <laughs> this is going to be a, important part afterwards, that um, the size of your reference, of course, is, is uh, an important step because if you have a big reference, you're just going to be able to, uh, you're going to be able to locate big distortions, right? And if you're going to uh, use a small reference, you might get um, your finer distortions, but the, the, it could also be that um, you might um, just, you're too flexible and um, whatever you detect as distortion is not a distortion. So this is a critical part, the size of a reference. So before you transform it again, and by the, this looks almost the same as here, but um, trust me, it's not. Oh, well, this is actually the comparison already. So, as we said, it's the multiplication of the Fourier transform of the reference with the loosely masked image. So, we do this in Fourier space because it's much, much faster right? and easier. And then what we get is a cross correlation map. And the cross correlation map, you can see here, um, have distinct peaks. And you, you could already, by eye, span a lattice here, right? You see even these strokes. 
but they they're not on a perfect lattice and so comparing these two to distinguish which are peaks we actually use um, um, use an autocorrelation of the reference with itself and compare it with the cross correlation map and this then gives you um, a, it gives you the deviations from the perfect lattice which you can plot with these uh, in this distortion plot as vectors and this is this is 10 times elongated so you um, the it's a you have to divide this by 10 to get the actual distortion right and usually it should look something like a fur we all, always say so here you almost have no distortions but here you have these gra this gradient and you could trust this what what you shouldn't see is these crossings because then then there must have been something wrong so it's always um, important to look at this plot and see, pay attention All right and when you have these distortions you can actually just take the areas and move them around right just take these areas move them around um, and transform them again and then you'll get an, an unbent image so here the contrast is actually inverted at protein is black so, but you can you you correct for this in to the x image in the end so now I want to go into more tricks about um, how to def de define your reference we've heard that we tightly mask but by and by default we'll just take the uh, center of your um, of your image so this um, but maybe so it's, it's not from the whole uh, from the full, whole image you cut an area and what you can how you can improve your reference in, in the beginning is that you search your crystal search your image where um, you have a nice perfect or a crystalline area good crystalline area because you want that in your reference right because Every, all the distortions that you have in, in the reference, um, you cannot account for, you cannot correct, because they're already in your reference. So we've seen uh, in 2DX image how you do this with the um, selection-based FFT, and you just scroll over it. That's what you would do, and then just try to determine the area where, it, where um, you have the most diffraction spots. And, that, and then you can manually select the area of your reference. We've seen, for the reference, we've seen that uh, we've selected spots that we tightly mask. Mm -hmm. And I told you already that these spots are the ones with high single to noise ratio. So this can be done automatically um, by the program. Because it, obviously the program can calculate you um, the single to noise ratio, but um, you can also do it by hand. And you, what I haven't said yet, but when unbending, the result will be that you will get spots further out, right? So you're um, trying to improve your resolution by unbending. All right, so um, last but not least, the parameters that define in here. I mean, it's, I think you get now all the, uh, the, the steps of how unbending is done. Now I'll go into detail of um, some part, um, some parameters that need to be tweaked and that are really critical. So box A I already mentioned is the size of the reference um, that you cut out. Hole A, so A is just um, just a variable name. There's hole B as well. That's if you if you do different turns. I just kept it like this because th this is what you're gonna uh, going to see in the um, into in the graphical user interface of 2DX image. So um, hole A is 
the re how how tightly you mask the reference. As I already said, it's a one pixel or two pixel maybe. So this is all defined on pixel basis. Um, mask A is how you Fourier filter your original image. This is obviously bigger because if this mask A and whole A would be the sa same, then you would compare the same thing. So it wouldn't make any sense, right? So you don't want your mask A to be too small because then you're um, artificially already um, filtering away what could be a diffraction spot, but you'll never get to it because you don't you don't account for it anymore. So um, when I first started on bending, this was really um, for me really like um, a pain. Oh, I'm gonna have to tweak all these three area, three parameters, right? And how do I actually measure if my unbending then, even if I change something here, how do I know that my unbending process ha has improved or how? or it was better than the last step. I mean, I could look at the profile here, at the distortions, but you'll never know. So uh, what we need is a quality measure. And the, this quality measure we have announced already. So um, for every diffraction spot, you can define an IQ value, which is um, Nothing but actually, uh, it's the single to noise ratio. Actually, it's the inverse of the single to noise ratio. So it's uh, it's just an easier way and a classification of your peaks. So you have your peak intensity and your background, and so that you have nice values. Um, you just um, multiply it by seven, then take the closest integer and add it by one. What that results in is that your IQ1 are the spots that are your best spots, right? So it's a rank. Um, and IQ1 means that the single to noise ratio, the P to background, is um, higher than 7, right? And actually an IQ7 spot is exactly where um, background and peak are the same. Is that clear? All right. So this is a it gives me a quality measure about um, how one of my how good my spots are. But if I now want an overall uh, overall measure of my image, I need to sum up somehow these values. And this is what the Q value, the Q quality value, um, is. So it's a weighted sum of all these IQ values in our image, right? And it's just you take all the IQ spots and weight them accordingly. Obviously, your IQ1 is going to be weighted higher than the IQ, IQ2 spots. And then what you also need is R, which denotes the height of the central pixel of... Um, the average Fourier peak profile, and this 500 is just to give you a nice number. So your quality value is going to be between 0 and 1,000. So we're actually, um, in, in our office, we have a list of whoever got the highest Q value. I think so far Fabian is leading, Priyanka is right, right next uh, after him. Unfortunately, I can't participate because the data. I have higher Q values, but uh, it's not my data. So. <laughs> but we, if you have your own data, um, feel free to come to me with your Q value. Then we can put you on the list. We haven't decided on what, what's the prize, though. All right. So, but what you can see the quality value, um, the quality, uh, the IQ spots. Um, so this is a different representation of your power spectrum now where every um, spot is denoted by its IQ value. And we've colored it and of course um, the IQ1 spots are more distinct, are, um, yeah, are bigger and also colored differently. I think it's a nice plot to, to see actually where your good spots are and where not. And you also see the effect of the ton rings, right? This is also what 
I sometimes use to um, see if my defocus is correct because you shouldn't get any spots on your cone ring or on the zero crossing of your CTF um, because, yeah, it's obviously zero. All right. So I still haven't told you, now we have a quality measure, but I ha still haven't told you how you define your parameters. And yeah, sometimes I think it's still, yeah, some kind of um, black magic, but it, it's not. Now that we have a measure, we can measure, uh, we can evaluate our unbending process. And in 2DX, you will have you have these refine this custom script called refine parameters unbend unbend one unbend two. And you can refine your parameters. And refine is it's really simple, right? So it takes a while, but you have a switch here. Say, okay, I want to refine my mask A. Mask A is how you Fourier filter your original image. And obviously you don't have, you shouldn't be too small. So this is defined. So you define a list which starts with um, a radius of five pixels and goes to 45. This is actually limited and the so, um, software corrects for it as well by the, your smaller lattice vector divided by two because otherwise you'll get an overlap, right? With your, with your neighboring peaks and so you could try all these different and it's a so here is the step size so i'm going from 5 to 45 with a step size of one so i'm just trying all these um all these different masks and measure then the q val of the unbending procedure so this takes a while because you 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 have to do unbending all the time and just measure q val and you come up with a plot where here, for example, in it was 13 that was the best mask. And that's usually what I use also as default value. Um, but, uh, well, you, you also have to refine your um, reference size that is depicted by box A. So it's actually the length of your reference, but it's a square reference. And you do the same thing. Um, um, here, of course, you shouldn't be too small, like I said, otherwise you just get um, correlate with everything. Be too flexible. And here I do a step size that is a bit bigger because I, didn't want, I, I don't want to wait and do 700 unbending steps. But this can actually also, um, we've improved it, this that you have um, these custom scripts course to find where you give a um, big range and then it remembers of course, from the previous step sizes, does another refinement where it does smaller steps. So it does that automatically for you. Um, one draw, so you also get a group value for your reference size, in this case, 250 pixels. Um, what I did not mention, but what is crucial is actually that these parameters, of course, are not independent. So whatever you define now, um, when we were um, trying to refine our mask, we were always using the same box, right? And vice versa. So we are actually only going in one direction and you want to feel the, find the optimum for both values. So what you can do is um, refine them both um, simultaneously. So you go for um, uh, mask A from 10 to 40, for example, and from box A for, from 250 or 200 here um, to 800, and then you get a global optimum, basically. Which is not, this is not a ni ni the nicest plot I've found, um, but it, it should show you some things. And, um, and you, you have to keep in mind, so you can also do overfitting there. You can also do noise correlation. So it's still, it's not um, waterproof, right? So you still um, should go back and see um, how your distortion plot looked like. And 
of course, there's all, all, always going to be some uh, at the borders where you, if you go with your mask all the way down and with your box all the way down, you'll find everything. And then, but then you're just correlating noise. Should have probably be put in a better thing. But um, the effect actually of this, so this is our power spectrum. I hope you can see it actually. Oops. Um, from our original image. And then when we unbend it, uh, I want you to look at, for example, in this area and also at the, um, sh the sharpness of the spot, you'll see that down here, a lot of peaks come, come about. Um, you get a more diffraction spot, a more distinct diffraction spot as well in the middle of it. And this is, this is what unbending can do for you. So you can improve your resolution and um, with unbending. But you still have to be careful, of course, that you're not just correlating noise. And I took this image. This was, um, of course, we haven't seen the rest of the pipeline, how you get to your projection map. But just to give you um, a more ex a, a better example, because maybe you're not used to <laughs> looking at the um, power spectrum yet, um, this is the the first result that I got, and then I refined on bending. So I already unbent here as well, but then I refined on bending, and the result that I got afterwards is like this. this. So you can already see that the the um, the structure is much finer. Or more deep. So, what I haven't told you yet is that, or I've just um, a little bit and um, talked about it, is that you actually um, do this in different iterations. So, first, you want to get rid of just the coarse um, distortions, and then you you when you're more sure about um, about your crystal and you already unbend some um, your crystal a little bit, you can um, from that extract a new reference, which is obviously will be better because you're doing it from your correct from your partially corrected image, and then unbend again. And this is how, why we we usually do that in two passes, where Unbend 2 actually use, does two passes again, but with the same mask. But this, these are just details. But you shouldn't unbend more than three times, right? Because you also um, unbend noise. On, uh, you can also unbend noise, and then all of a sudden, I mean, you can unbend to everything if you're doing it wrong. And um, you actually see here, there's a hist history for the log br browser that you get up when you click here and you see all the, um, see all your previous unbending um, tries that you did with, with the associated mask, um, the reference size and the quality val value. And here we have a status bar, unfortunately it's, it's not that big, where you, where you have the quality value of your first run and your second run. And, of course, the quality value of your second run has to be better. Otherwise, you did something, you did something totally wrong. Right? Because then that would mean that in unbending 2, you actually um, did something, well, you decreased the quality after unbending 1. And this is depicted here with this nice arrow. <laughs> so that you just re-unbend. Um, last but not least, what I've neglected to say, so I, I said we, we extract a reference from our image, and therefore we actually cannot account, we do not account for rotational distortions. Right? So we correct in-plane distortions, but not the rotation um, is somehow neglected. And therefore, but there's a, um, somehow neglected, but there's a different method for that. Uh, 
for example, you could use a single particle approach, and we'll hear um, about that um, later this week from Cheng and Zhang, how um, you can deal with that. Then what we um, last we've seen this distortion plot, and from this distortion plot, we actually see that up here we don't have a crystalline area. And what you can do then is mask. And how you do that, you'll hear more from Christina. So with that, I want to end this talk. I'm sorry if I, but, uh, if I tortured you with unbending, but I hope um, this is really an important step. So it's um, important to me that you understand this. And feel free to ask questions. Yes, Mark? The control time for the PDF is the selection stop, so for the support for the first time, I've only done seven, seven months. Yes, exactly. Is there any advantages to the higher IQ across the first time being done? So, higher IQ, you mean you would already take IQ 7 in the first round? No, I am um, lower. Lower. Yeah, actually, so, so these, all these parameters, I, I didn't, so what Mark pointed out is um, the, this is also one parameter that you can change is what um, you actually take in what you consider for using your, uh, for, for the reference. So there you also, I, I told you about the IQ value, so the signal to noise, which is based on the signal to noise ratio and which spot you take for your reference. Um, I'm really conservative about this because you don't want noise in your reference. So I actually, yeah, I actually used three in my first round and three in the second round as well. So I know the, def the default values are four to seven, but I, um, and we'll see this later this afternoon that I'll change quite, quite some of the values. But it's, it's an ongoing discussion. Yes. When you do unbending on your image. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Are these pieces the same inner size to the reference or smaller or, or just one unit size? Um, no, there's a, they, you want them to be uh, based on your reference, right? So when you draw your find best reference, mm. then you need that size to end up. Um, now. Yeah, well, yeah, the mask, and yeah, um, well, actually, no, no, because your cross correlation map, right? You you correlate every the cross correlation means you correlate every you go over the whole image and you get every, pi every a, a value. For, yeah, exactly. No, well, well, a value for every pixel, right? And then, but you. So you have to say that you do it for the spots. You do it in for for intensive. So you have the diffraction for the spots, right? So um, so you with um, CC on bend, you get the distortion plot, and then you shift parts of the area. Um, the size, should, but I actually don't exact. I'm not sure about the size. I have to I have to check it. Out. I mean, it, it depends on where you want to see it. If you want to imagine what Unbend does in real space, yeah, it would mean that you the reference, so you, 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 you can adjust the parameter for your reference area. So this would mean you really say if you just take one unit cell or if you take like 10 by yeah. 10 unit cells. Yeah. So and this in is what. In case, it would then shift the 10 yeah. unit cells by 10, but it would then shift around. This again is a parameter. I didn't, I didn't go into that. But if, if you go. Right here. So this is you can define it here actually. This uh, this part that there's a spot uh, there's a parameter there as well. Because you the size of your reference you're not gonna yeah. And there's also one one thing you could argue with is that we only shift 
and we don't linear interpolate. But the, the like you could do smooth unbending. But there's a paper um, from Jose Maria Carazzo on the nature of unbending. They they um, actually compared the both methods and say that they're equally um, yeah equally good. And so you don't have to. It's just an addition. And so you don't have to linearly uh, interpolate because you're not gaining that much. And it's actually also not in the nat uh, nature of the distortions. Of if, as far as I understand, I mean, there you, you more the expert, it's a, I mean, the distortions come about also from, I don't know, cracks in the ice or just shifting. And then, and these wouldn't be smooth, usually. That's how I usually explain it for myself. Sorry, I mean, you. Yeah, you move. No, you move patches, and then you smooth. Then you smooth through. You go back and transform Fourier transform in it, and by that you actually smooth it. Again. And again. Is that understandable? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Well, so you move the patches, then you, um, then you have a, <laughs> then you transform it again, right? And then you back transform it again. So, so what you can do is, um, what was this again? So, um, when you, uh, when you interpolate. So, so it's it's a smoothing by going back and forth in the Fourier transform. I'm not sure of the details. Yeah, Angie, yeah. could you help me? Yes. Yeah. No, it's just giving you the distortion, this plot. Yeah. This plot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 10. So the, 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 the amount is moving is really very small. Mm -hmm. And the amount of that is very small. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the movement, the patch movement, is uh, in conformance with the land length. And uh, also, I think it's just because of the length of the actual dividing of the axis is even smaller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Each patches, yeah. Yeah, exactly. No. 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 It's 25 pixels. <laughs> Thanks for looking it up. Yeah. So, so, but you can also vary that one in, in the, in 2DX image. Yeah. And so there's, there's still it's, a famous one. One is called uh, CC Unbend A. Is the year 2000 version of the MIT program, and then it's uh, typically 25 pixels.
it's clear. So some kind of contract is there. Um, and then the discussion was at the edge between two, two of these blocks that are moved, so you can just um, have fractions. And for a screening crystal, the amendment property, we, we don't know this yet, we don't see it because the data are so noisy. But uh, a third of the users of the software are material sciences people. And they have STEM pictures of operations, they have the STEMs of Athens. Their the picture, the entire picture, is set by five atoms. And each atom is round with a big clock. And then, then the unbending cuts an atom in, in half, and you have like half an atom here and half an atom here. They are really mad. And so the software is pretty fast. And so um, we programmed another version of this unbending program, which does a smooth unbending pixel by pixel. And that's called CP Unbend H. And that's for material sciences pixel, uh, pictures, so that the atoms uh, stay round. Yeah, and then you can move the, the entire picture a little bit smooth. And it's doing a good job of interpolation. And the funny thing is, <coughs> um, it makes things not better, but worse for CD crystal. So if you do a pixel-wise spline with the interpolated uh, unbending, it gets worse. And it's better with better than 25 pixel blocks to move the block. And the reason may be that if you distort the entire image smoothly, to distort also the, um, the entire transfer process from the Telecom microscope, to the, the constraint function, and everything you distort it in this elliptical thing. Whereas if you instead take a block of a picture and move the entire block, then at least within that block, it's all intact. And so what Henderson is doing is he corrects um, crystal defects in physical, biological crystals, whereas in material sciences, the, the atoms are perfect, and what you correct there is the microscope distortion. Yeah, so it's some big fucking distortion of your lens system. And so as long as we are in biology, we need to use the um, unbent K program, which shifts blocks around. And if you are in material sciences and you want to have high contrast atoms and look at them, then you need to use the unbent H. Yeah. So. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, Hans? Yeah, because I think it's just a technical detail, no? It's just um, instead of taking so how you distinguish the, what is actually a peak at what you take. You could also go through, a, um, through your cross-correlation map and say just um, I take all the values that are above a certain, uh, all the peaks that are above cer a certain value, but you're not right in there. So you autocollate this reference and you cut out the middle. So you get basically what um, you, you can look at it in, can look at it in, uh, I'm not doing anything. How do I stop? All right, sorry. <laughs> this is just, <laughs> no, it, it's just so I can think about the question. <laughs> they don't even have chalk. All right, um, so, um, if you, you can look at it in 2DX and what you see is usually you should get this round blob and what it is is if you cut through here um, what you get is this is x and y or u and v it, you should get some, some kind of Gaussian and then you um, then you um, correlate this with your cross correlation map and therefore get peaks. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, of course. So this is take that, that therefore it's the, this this is taken into account by that other correlation function. Yes, this is done automatically. Yeah. So, yeah, of course, you will have, um, so this is the ideal case, but it could be also something elliptical. And therefore, you also, 
um, but therefore you also have to compare with this to get um, your 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 cross correlation uh, your peaks which you then use for the cross correlation. Yeah. Instead of taking the maximum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you use this. Yeah. Because this is the other example of the conjunction. Yeah. It's a red line. You can change for that. So if you have a very elliptical oscillation, so um, that you can expect for that. Crystals were very nicely ordered in one direction and terribly badly ordered in the other direction. And so he wanted the unbending to be really strict in one direction and loose in the other. And then he used this autocorrelation map from the Upton parameter to allow the unbending to be tolerant in one direction and strict in the other. And then it worked. Hmm. Any other questions? Thank you very much.